And the concept of, of cold shutdown really means that the entire system uh. is at 100 degrees. And because this is a big lump somewhere in the core, the core is in the, the reactor or on the floor outside the reactor, that concept is, um, uh, it sounds nice, but really it's a meaningless concept. Yeah, and, and the, the lump is about 100 tons, is it? Um, at least 100 tons, yeah. And in, in each reactor. In each clear. reactor, so that's, three, uh, that's unbelievable. Now, I've checked with you again and again, Arnie, and you keep saying that the daily atmospheric release from those three reactors is 12,000 trillion becquerels of radiation a day, and a becquerel is a disintegration per second of radiation. Now, wh do you still stand by that, or what would you say the release, and it's, of course it's an estimated release because they're not really measuring it per se, but what, what do you say now, Arnie? Um, well, of course, when they've, now that they've wrapped up Unit 1, there's less releases, and hopefully when the filters turn on, there'll be less releases. I think it's, they said it was around 13 billion uh, becquerels per day. And, um, Terra becquerels, I said. 13 trillion. Yeah, 13 trillion, trillion, trillion. Becquerels per day yes. With a T. And um, now I think it's down to about 10. Um, oh, 10. That's, uh, that's a lot of radiation even now, but compared trillion. to, of course, what it released in the, uh, at the beginning, it yeah. appears to be much lower. In fact, if any plant released that kind of radiation under normal circumstances, it would be shut down. So they seem to be happy with the number, but again, if it was any other plant in the world, it would be oh, shut down. It's right unbelievable. Now. now, so you sent me a report the other day, and I can't remember who wrote it. I should have um, looked at this, about xenon-133 and cesium-137 releases into the atmosphere from Fukushima. And they said that Regarding xenon-133, which is called a noble gas, and I can explain that to the audience in a minute, what that means, we find a total release of 16.7 E becquerels, which is the largest radioactive noble gas release in history, not associated with nuclear bomb testing. There is strong evidence that the first xenon-133 release started very early, possibly immediately after the earthquake, and the emergency shutdown on 11th of March at 6 a.m. The entire noble gas inventory of reactor 20 units, 1 to 3, that's 1, 2 and 3, was set free into the atmosphere between the 11th of March and the 15th of March 2011. The largest release in history. Um, do you want to comment on noble gases, Arnie, what they are and what that would have meant to the population of Japan? Yeah, noble gases are, um, um, are in the fuel, but they're held inside the fuel as long as the zircaloy cladding is in place. But what, the, uh, what that report, and it's a phenomenal report, it's breathtaking in its, um, in its analysis, uh, what that report says is that the fuel failed very soon after the earthquake. You know, they were seeing it within the very first hour. And that leads, uh, a lot of us have thought that Unit 1 had problems right from the get-out, that it wasn't the tsunami, but Unit 1 had fuel problems and, and was in a meltdown condition even before the tsunami hit. And that confirms it. When they saw early releases of, of xenon-133, um, that means that the clad broke, and, and it's a noble gas, so it just goes right out. It's not captured in the water, it's not captured in the air, and it goes right out. Then later, probably three, four, five, ten hours later, as the fuel failed in Units 2 and 3, they had uh, additional spikes you know, of, um, of xenon gases. What it does is it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cloud. It's a xenon cloud that moves with the weather, and it bombards people with, um, with external gamma rays, which are really powerful x-rays. Um, the, so the predominant exposure from, from these are that they bombard people with, uh, with x-rays. Um, they also then 
as they decay, they turn into iodine-133 or, or uh, um, strontium-90 as a krypton. Krypton-90 decays to strontium-90. So there's other isotopes that then have a second shot at you. But the noble gases are a cloud that bombards people from the outside. We found that after Three Mile Island, a uh, dramatic increase, a measurable, statistically meaningful increase in lung cancer in people that were in that cloud. That shows up about three to five years after the accident. Yeah, um, xenon actually converts and decays to cesium, and krypton decays to um, yeah. strontium. So I, let me explain what noble gases are from a biochemical and medical perspective. Noble gases do not combine chemically in the body, um, the, but they are absorbed actually through the lung. And I used to use xenon for ventilation perfusion scans in my cystic fibrosis patients to see what areas of their lung were all clagged up with pus and, and, and collapse of the lung and what areas were still being ventilated and perfused with blood. But the noble gases, xenon, krypton and argon, are in fact absorbed from the lung and we use xenon these days um, to measure fatty deposits in the body because xenon, well, they're very fat-soluble. So they tend to go and dissolve in the fatty deposits of the body which are mainly located in the abdomen and upper thighs, which is exactly where the gonads, the testicles and ovaries are situated. And because you talked about they give out huge doses of what you would call X-rays, gamma rays, they are bombarding the genes in the eggs and sperm with radiation which can induce mutations and cause down the time track through generations genetic diseases such as cystic fibrosis, diabetes, hemochromatosis, dwarfism, inborn errors of metabolism, uh, phenylketonuria. In fact, there are 2,600 such diseases. And it's important to know, for people to know that evolution took place when the Earth was much radiologically hotter. And so mutations occurred which were advantageous to a, 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 an environment, like fish develop lungs and birds develop wings. But the truth is most mutations are deleterious. They cause disease. Very few are advantageous. And, of course, evolution took place over eons and eons and eons of time. But what we're doing by um, fissioning atoms in nuclear power plants and bombs is increasing dramatically the background level of radiation um, in, in, a, in a most artificial way, which will inevitably induce deleterious mutations, which will be passed on through the generations um, and cause, if you like, random compulsory genetic engineering. So people need to know what these noble gases are and what they do and that they are also not just released during an accident but they're released continuously from reactors. They're called routine emissions. Like, don't worry about it. They're just routine, you see. But if you live near a reactor, you could be immersed, depending on inversion systems and, and meteorological conditions, in clouds of xenon, krypton and argon. And as you just said, Arnie, they decay to other nasty things like strontium and cesium. So it's important to, for people to understand that. But my question now to you, Arnie, is the total release of xenon was 16.7 E becquerels. What's an E Becquerel. What are E becquerels? What's the number? What does that mean? It, it should have been 16. E means 10 to the power. Oh. And there should be a number after that E. Oh. Um, and I, I have a hunch that the document you're reading from doesn't, there, there must be a typo in there. It would be 16 with, with 10 to the power number of zeros behind it. All right. Well, now then we go on in the same paper to um, cesium-137, and, and it says, this paper says, a total emission of cesium-137 was 35.8 P becquerels, P for Paul. And I need to refer people to what that paper is, and in, in fact, I can, I've got my computer here. 
I can look it up here because I took it from something you sent me yesterday, Arnie, um, which was incredibly important. It comes from the Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics Discussions. That's the Atmospheric Chemistry and Phys Physics Discussions, Volume 11, 2011. And the name of the paper is Xenon-133 and Cesium-137 Releases into the Atmosphere from the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant, Determination of the Source Term, Atmospheric Dispersion and Deposition. Uh, so that's... That people can look it up and get the actual data. So, yeah, okay, Arnie, let's go on to Unit 4. That same paper, you know, we all know that Unit 1, 2, and 3 melted down. Um, the Tokyo Electric is saying that the Unit 4 pool always had water over the top of it. And, of course, I've been saying that's not the truth. I'm not saying it boiled dry, but I am saying that the top of the nuclear fuel was definitely exposed uh, as all that heat boiled off the water. But what the paper showed is that when TEPCO finally got the fire hoses and finally sprayed water into that pool, um, the radioactive releases dropped dramatically. So the paper supports my position that the fuel was uncovered, that the cladding broke at the top, and released things like cesium-137 into the atmosphere. So the paper actually says that the biggest source of radiation was likely to be the Unit 4 fuel pool. So that's, um, uh, that's another problem with this Mark 1 containment and Mark 1 fuel pool, that um, uh, the fuel pools are so highly radioactive that an event that doesn't even dry them out, but an, an event that causes them to boil to, the, to where the top of the fuel is covered, can release enormous amounts of radiation. But didn't you show a video, Arnie Gunderson, some time ago of the explosion at Unit 4 Pool, which you thought might be an excursion or, in fact, uh, that it reached critical mass at some point? Wasn't that the Unit 4 fuel pool? That was the Unit 3 fuel pool. Oh, Unit 3. The, the, the dramatic explosion that has the enormously high cloud is the Unit 3 fuel pool. And you're right, though. I, I do believe that it was something we call a prompt, moderated criticality uh, in that fuel pool. It accounts for a lot of things we found, like plutonium being deposited on site. And, of course, TEPCO bulldozed a lot of that underground so that uh, uh, personnel wouldn't get overexposed. But there's also uh, data that says that plutonium was found in you know, chunks, not, not single atoms, but chunks of nuclear fuel were found um, one and two miles away. So um, in order to have that kind of an uplift force, I believe that the Unit yeah. 3 fuel pool had a prompt, moderated criticality. Well, now, wasn't it Unit 3 that had 7% of its fuel was MOX fuel? In other words, mixed plutonium and uranium oxide. Was that Unit 3 fuel pool? And if so, was it in... Uh, Unit 3 reactor, if so, it must have been in the fuel pool as well, right? Unit 3 had 30 test bundles of MOX fuel. Um, so I don't think the MOX fuel um, dramatically changed anything. But you have to remember, all of these reactors, 1, 2, and 3, had been running for four and a half years. So they, they had enormous amounts of plutonium. MOX stands for mixed oxide or, or fuel that's got plutonium in it. So all four, all three reactors that were running had an enormous amount of plutonium in them because that's what uranium-238 becomes when it sits in a nuclear reactor for a long period of time. I don't think the MOX fuel in Unit 3, um, perhaps it made a 1 or 2 or 3 percent difference, but in the big picture, the plutonium in Unit 3 came from Unit 3 being operated for, for uh, four and a half years. Do you want to talk about the toxicity of plutonium, Arnie Gunderson? Um, I think you could better do that, but it's a, a very dangerous substance <laughs> named after the god of hell. 